Good evening and uh, welcome to Behind the Headlines. Today is Wednesday the 22nd of September 2021 and in this programme tonight we are going to be talking about the terror and the violence that is being afflicted upon the Christians in the north of Nigeria. It's almost like a forgotten genocide as we see all terror organisations like Boko Haram and ISIS as well as um, uh, Fulani herdsmen attacking and ethnically cleansing the Christians from the north. The situation has got worse as we see they're spreading to the middle of Nigeria called the, uh, the uh, Nigerian Middle Beltway. Uh, and so in this programme today we'll be asking why is the world silent but more importantly why is the church so silent when it comes to the genocide facing the Christians in the north of Nigeria? Uh, Reagan, it's great to, to uh, be doing a programme with you again, but uh, particularly on this very sad issue as the Nigerian Christians are uh, under immense persecution uh, from Islamic terrorist organisations. Absolutely, Simon. Uh, for many years I've been aware of this in the background, and, uh, and uh, look, according to my notes here, according to the uh, US com uh, Commission on Religious Freedom, uh, more Christians have been killed for their faith in Nigeria in 2020 than in the entire Middle East. And it's time that our world woke up, it's time that our government woke up, it's time that our media woke up, but more importantly, it's time that our churches woke up to the plight of Christians living in northern Nigeria, including the middle belt of uh, Nigeria today, before it's too late. Uh, and, and sadly, we see that uh, so much uh, attacks are happening against Christians in Nigeria. And this has been going on for over two decades now. And uh, the situation is not getting any better. It's getting worse. And what we've also seen that the... The Taliban uh, regaining power in Afghanistan, the, uh, the collapse of uh, US military forces uh, and the withdrawal of American forces from Afghanistan has accelerated this, uh, this hatred and this violence and terrorism that we're seeing today across the world, but also in, in Nigeria as well. Um, so also we see that, uh, for example, the situation in, in Nigeria is, is complex. I mean, Nigeria is a complex uh, African country. It's the most populated country in Africa, but it's also divided between two parts, the north and the south of Nigeria, where predominantly the Christians live in the south and the Muslims live in the, in the north. The population is around 50-50. And um, we see that in the north, for example, that uh, Christians are not tolerated uh, by by the, the kind of Muslims in the north. And uh, this is a situation that is going out of control now as even the uh, US Commission for um, uh, Religious Freedom has identified Nigeria as a country of serious concern. I think you're back with us now, aren't you? I'm back, sorry for that technical issue. Um, one of the things, Simon, that we need to remember is that uh, it's a very complicated setup across Nigeria. I mean, we, we have a massive country. It's four times larger than the UK. There are 36 states. There are 371 different tribes with 500 different languages spoken. So it, it's not much of a surprise that there's going to be some tensions um, that arise uh, when you try to bring all of these groups under one setting when um, you have a democratic Western liberal style government that uh, there's an attempt to uh, to form and and hold. It, it's always going to encounter some difficulties. I mean, we, we have that um, even in, in the UK. So w when you're dealing with 371 different tribes that are completely different eth ethnically but are native to that geographical region, um, it, it creates some tensions automatically. But uh, one of the things that's by and large overlooked when it comes to the mainstream media uh, and I, I know viewers will be familiar with this story whether you uh, yourself are a Nigerian or not um, even our non-Nigerian viewers will be very familiar from the stories on even BBC and in, in newspapers of marauding Fulani herdsmen um, killing 
in some cases entire villages or um, large groupings of people. And it's generally framed in those exact words, marauding Fulani herdsmen. And it's uh, coined in this sense that y you come away thinking this is purely tribal. It's um, tragic, but it's, it's only tribal. There's no real ideology um, that's linked to it. Uh, what's often left out is that these marauding Fulani herdsmen are radicalized Islamists um, and they are working in, in, in some cases independently but in some cases side by side with um, ISWA, that's our, um, the Islamic State in West Africa, and, um, and Boko Haram. Boko Haram being um, easily one of the top terror groups in its own right in terms of the devastating toll um, it, it's meted out. This is a personal story to some degree um, for me. I have many friends who are from Nigeria. Uh, my fellow pastor up until last year um, at the Angel Church, he was from Nigeria. My father um, has been to Abuja, uh, one of the, the primary hot spots for this persecution on many occasions uh, to visit Christians. And so um, I, I've, over the years, had feedback and heard a lot about some of the trials that Christians are experiencing. Um, but, you know, last year, in the past year, it, it seems to have gotten worse. Even uh, in the world watch list for the persecuted church, Nigeria is now in the top 10 uh, most dangerous places to be a Christian. I mean, it's extraordinary to think that in 2020 that more Christians have died for their faith in uh, Nigeria than the entire Middle East combined. Um, and if you consider the genocide against Christians committed by ISIS and others and the, the persecution that Christians face in, in uh, Iran and, and Yemen and, and Syria and other places in the mm. Middle East, um, extraordinary uh, numbers of deaths. But let's have a look at this excellent um, CBN news report um, that looks into the crisis that is taking place and the attacks against Christians in Nigeria. General of U.S. Special Operations Command in Africa is warning that Al-Qaeda, ISIS and other Islamic terror groups are now trying to take over parts of the continent's most populous nation. Major General Dagvin Anderson says Muslim terrorists have set their sights on Nigeria's southern and northwestern regions and the U.S. is now sharing specific intelligence with the country. So this intelligence sharing is absolutely vital and we stay fully engaged with the government of Nigeria to uh, provide them an understanding of what these terrorists are doing. Their goal? Eventually turn Nigeria into a Muslim country and force Christians who make up half the country's population to either leave or convert. Christians are in the eye of the, the target and, and they're coming after them. And the numbers are staggering. August 6th, Muslims stormed four remote Christian villages in Kaduna State, killing 22 villagers. July 24th, 21 dead, scores injured, and several Christian homes destroyed by militants. July 19th, 19 people killed when assailants armed with guns and machetes attacked a wedding reception. And the list goes on. Leading human rights groups say what's going on in Nigeria is a genocide. If you look at what's happened uh, on the last 20 years, George, it's just massive, massive number of attacks against Christians. Uh, look, 50 to 70,000 have been murdered. For years, the main terror group was Boko Haram, which seeks to overthrow the government here and create an Islamic state. They go after Christians and moderate Muslims. They push a hardline Muslim agenda. It is their intention to establish a caliphate and to uh, just rid all of Nigeria and West Africa of any Western influence whatsoever. Now, there's a new actor on the scene. In Nigeria's so-called Middle Belt region, where the Muslim North meets the Christian South, a terror group made up of Muslim Fulani herders are killing thousands of Christians. More than 1,400 Christians were hacked to death in just the first seven months of 2020 by Fulani herders. Unfortunately, the secular media are uh, quite often biased and trying to present this as a tribal conflict rather than religious. Nigeria's president, a Muslim, has so far done very little to stop the bloodshed. His police and army are also mostly made up of Muslims. 
the attackers are never captured. They are not prosecuted. The security services respond very slowly. A, a full day can go on with attacks happening and no security shows up. And frequently, the government officials will provide cover. Helpless and vulnerable to almost daily attacks, leading Catholic bishops are now urging Nigerian Christians to defend themselves. Human rights groups are asking the White House to appoint a special envoy to help end the persecution of Christians in Nigeria. Unless the world takes note and puts pressure, economic pressure, sanctions, uh, visa bans on the officials who are responsible for this travesty and for not reigning in the terror, then uh, Nigeria will continue to be a bloodbath. Meanwhile, King's Group is helping more than 3,000 Christians who lost their businesses, homes, farms or land to Boko Haram and Fulani militant attacks. International Christian Concern has created communal farms to give victims the opportunity to rebuild their lives. When they get back to work, the family is fed, they have a future, the kids can go back to school. It's a restoration of hope, it really is. Um, and it's much more than just economics. It's it's the whole community, it's all the parts of life, the emotional, the physical, the mental. It means a lot to them. George Thomas, CBN News. Excellent report there put together by uh, George Thomas looking at the plight of Christians in Nigeria, which is of serious, serious concern. Uh, just to remind you that we are live, we are interactive tonight, so please uh, respond to the question we put in tonight's programme is, why is the church silent to the genocide in Nigeria? And we know that this genocide is targeting Christians and it's getting worse. So I'd love to know your views, your comments, if you come from the Nigerian community. We'd love to know your thoughts on what's happening to your fellow Christians in Nigeria. We have this from Kev. He says, hi, the things that are going on in Nigeria are darkness moving over this country. It is bringing things to the surface. The madness is just that, a madness that is out of control. Satan loves nothing better than those that have no control or mindset of right or wrong. Let us stand with all our brothers and sisters in Nigeria. Darkness needs to be spoken out um, to see the truth of what is happening. Evil will never win as our sweet Jesus is coming to take back what is his. Let us be bold in our truth walk with Jesus. Anita says, hi Simon and Reagan. It's always a pleasure to see you both. It's always a pleasure to hear from you, Anita. Having watched the episode of The Persecuted Church about this issue, I'm glad to see you discussing it. I believe over 2,000 Christians were murdered in Nigeria last year, almost half of uh, the Christian population. I think this stat is a little off there. Um, it's definitely not half of the Christian population, but um, quite, quite a significant number, as some has already shared, um, were murdered. I know a lot of it is due to the Fulani tribesmen, and it's said to be spreading to Burkini Faso too. That is correct, which um, worries me, as I have a friend who is a Christian missionary there. I have to admit, I cried seeing some of the scenes of what is going on. Mom and I pray for all the persecuted Christians every day. Nigeria are on the list. It's heartbreaking. Uh, Simon, churches are being set on fire, destroyed. Pastors are being abducted. They're held to extortionate ransom. Christian girls are kidnapped. I mean, who, who can forget back in 2014, there were over 300 girls who were kidnapped. And most of those, what, um, while this gained worldwide coverage, what many people were aware of is that they were primarily from Christian um, households and they were kidnapped prim primarily by uh, Islamists. And the story is predictable. They were um, taken, forced into marriages, essentially raped, uh, those who survived, and uh, eventually some were sent back or Some escaped taken. as well, I think. Yep, that's yep. right. Yeah, but, um, I mean, th this is, it's, it's grim. It's grim. And, we, uh, and what was the response from the White House, from the Obama White House, was uh, just to send out a few tweets, uh, and uh, Twitter's essentially hashtag free Nigerian girls. That was it. 
That, w that was the American response under Obama. Um, just do a social media campaign. And, and I'm sure that Boko Haram will be feeling very, very threatened by a number of tweets coming their way. And out of the goodness the of the right. heart, they will actually release them. If you get the hashtag right, it can be impactful. I mean, it, it, you know, I'm sorry. You, 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 the international community has failed Nigerian Christians in its response. Well, one of the things that I say routinely, I hear people when they speak of mass atrocities in history, and uh, they say these things like, it, never again, we'll never let it happen again. Uh, we'll never forget this, we'll never um, go back to, to that. It's not going to happen. It's happening right and left. Genocide is happening. I mean, it's not just in Nigeria, there is country after country where Christians are facing this sort of persecution and very few people comment. Uh, an additional factor, and the, the question, again, v viewers, this is a, a, a live and interactive program. Uh, why do you think the church is not saying that much about it. Now, okay, let's think through a couple of things here. Yeah, it's not the church's responsibility to pick up on every single global issue um, and, and try to make a comment or a statement on it, but the scriptures call us to pray for uh, those who are particularly of the household of faith, particularly our fellow brothers and sisters. And it, it, it is interesting that we, we tend to focus our attention on the persecuted church elsewhere, but I don't hear too many people focusing on the persecuted church in Africa. And sometimes when I've um, entered conversations or uh, been a part of conversations where some of the concerns of our N Nigerian brethren are raised, um, it's kind of dismissed almost, or, or it's put away, or it's trivialized, or it's, it's not really picked up on. And uh, um, honestly, maybe, maybe some viewers can feed back on that. I am concerned when I see that sort of response that there's some sense almost of racism that's like, well, okay, we're, we're, we'll talk about the North Korean Christians because that's just brutal and they're a very far away away. We'll, we'll talk about um, what's going on in the Middle East and, and everything. Um, but, but when it comes to Nigeria, where you're, you're, you've already said it, I believe, Simon, that more people died uh, for, for their faith, more Christians died last year in Nigeria than in the entire Middle East combined. When it comes to Nigeria, not much of anything is said. What's going on? It doesn't get the news coverage it deserves as well. So let's also yeah. realize this, that it doesn't get the, the kind of news attention, doesn't get the Why? focus that it deserves, because it doesn't, because, it's a region of the world that strategically doesn't affect us that uh -huh. much. So, for example, the Middle East, if something were to kick off in Europe, that would, that would actually threaten us the same in, in, in the Middle East. Then it threatens us. Likewise, we don't hear that much news when it comes to what's happening in, in Asia. We don't hear so much about uh, China's threats to Taiwan, China's threats to Vietnam, to Japan uh, and South Korea. We don't hear much of those because it's not in our issues. geographical no. location. But on behalf of the body of Christ, this is one of the biggest genocides facing Christians around the world mm. uh, and this is something we've got to wake up to I mean it's also important to note that in uh, that Nigeria in 1999 um, signed a constitution that protects the freedom of religion and belief that it prohibits the state from establishing a state religion from discriminating on the basis of religion the Nigerian criminal code includes a penalty of up to two years imprisonment for insulting a person's religion additionally uh, 12 Muslim majority northern states use uh, Islamic Sharia criminal and family codes alongside civil and customary laws. These are Sharia codes and they permit blasphemy. So in a sense that Nigeria's countries have signed up to these, uh, this constitution that protects religious freedom and religious beliefs. But what we're finding out now is that there is a currently a Muslim president who's turning a blind eye effectively to the murder, systematic murder of Christians, the ethnic cleansing of Christians to try and wipe them out from, 
of the north of Nigeria, right through also to the middle belt of Nigeria. And sooner or later, it's going to come to those Christians in the south. But also, I think this, the other problem is that uh, 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 quite a few years ago, um, went with Fred Williams. Now, I've got an interview coming up with Fred Williams, who's a campaigner on behalf of the Nigerian Christians, but also he's a filmmaker as well as a documentary maker. And um, we, we went to the, uh, I think this was probably around 2011 or so, uh, went to the Foreign Office. And we had meetings at the Foreign Office to say, look, you've got to understand the genocide that's coming against the Christians in Josh uh, and Abuja and other places in northern Nigeria. And the response from the Foreign Office was like, we're concerned about this as well. But the Nigerian community, Christian community needs to lobby us. They need to write letters to us. They need to campaign. So this is something that that we all need to get involved in and campaign and, and let the Foreign Office know, let our MPs know, because what the Christians there are facing is genocide and we can't allow this to happen on our watch. We have a few emails from Edith. Uh, in London, we hear African politics are essentially tribal, uh, which, as I said already, 371 tribes in Nigeria, and, and that leadership uh, comes from that. Uh, the Fulani herdsmen for years took their herds over farms and allotments of villagers and the peoples were able to chase them off, but for the last five years they could purchase guns and butchered the villagers. Barnabas Fund reports, and uh, that's from Gordon. Indeed, um, when you have access to greater um, technology, there's always the likelihood of greater danger and that falling into the wrong hands. That's what's happened there, Gordon. Some of the governments in Africa are Islamic, so don't care if Christians get killed. Also, a lot are corrupt. Um, that's a, an anonymous text, which um, it, it's, it's true. We do see that across the board, Islamic governments are not particularly friendly to the plight of Christians. It's not a, a primary concern. And as, as Simon's already mentioned, Nigeria does have an, uh, a Muslim president who is doing next to nothing in this regard. Nigeria also has um, experience for many, many years, despite being one of the wealthiest countries, if not the wealthiest in Africa. Um, it should be, uh, it should have an amazing economy. It should be really a leader in the rich, world. Rich in oil. Oh, uh, ex extremely. Rich in uh, Lagos. And Natural area. resources abound. I mean, a beautiful place, but due to corruption and due to um, that corruption extending from the top down even th throughout the tribes, it's not able to have that place in the world that it, it really should. We see it on a personal level where um, Islamists radicalize individuals who are uh, corrupted or uh, in some way um, uh, unable to fend for themselves and do certain things for themselves in a national way as well. This is what we're seeing where nations do not have strong leadership. They don't have clear direction going forward. There's some um, or a great deal of corruption there. It, it, it provides a really great seedbed for Islamic radicalization. That's what's happening in Nigeria. Uh, and the danger is that this could become the new uh, jihadi center of Africa in which uh, terrorist attacks are launched against the West from Nigeria. We've also seen that the Iranians have been involved in Nigeria with uh, trying to transfer weapons uh, and what have you over there. So we also know that this is of, of, of serious concern. But I think we also need to mention the fact that the US Commission on Religious Freedom uh, published its report in 2012. So the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom report 2021 has uh, warned of Christian genocide if the government of Nigeria cannot protect Christians from Islamic terrorism. They go on to say that Nigeria is listed as a country of particular concern, uh, designated for engaging in and tolerating systematic, ongoing and egregious violations of religious freedom. Um, and I'm just going to read out a little bit more because this is so important. It says that uh, the report detailed Boko Haram, the Islamic State, uh, West 
Africa province, uh, both active in persecuting Nigerian Christians. The report accuses the Nigerian government a problematic level of apathy for its failure to properly investigate and persecute Islamist violence against Christians. The report states that more Christians have been killed for their faith in Nigeria in the last year than the entire Middle East. And I'm just going to read this one. It says, uh, this is the introduction to the report. It says, in 2020, religious freedom conditions in Nigeria deteriorated, with both state and non-state actors committing uh, egregious violations of the right of freedom of religion or belief. Despite Nigeria's constitution uh, protecting freedom of religion and belief, uh, Nigerian citizens face violence by militant Islamists and other non-state armed actors, as well as discrimination, arbitrary detentions, a capital blasphemy sentences by state authorities and m uh, militant Islamic groups in Nigeria uh, continue to violate religious freedom in the northeast and expand to parts of the northwest of the country. With 300 churches being threatened or attacked or closed or destroyed since January 2021, it shouldn't come as a surprise when um, U.S. Senator Gary L. Bauer has commented that Nigeria is quickly becoming a killing field for that nation's Christians. Uh, the hours late, Nigeria's government seems unable or unwilling to stop the growing carnage. In large swathes of the country, Christian parents fear for their children every day when they go to school. Those children are targeted by savage Islamists who kidnap and force them to renounce Christ or face death. Indeed, every time Christians gather uh, for worship, uh, they face the very real prospect of that church being gunned down as people worship, of the church being set on fire with congregants locked inside. Um, we've seen, we've read reports of whole congregations massacred by a radical Islamist. Um, it is a tragedy. We have um, this from Caroline. The church isn't saying much about anything. We are, it's it, it, very, very astute. Um, quite right, Caroline. Um, the church isn't saying much about anything we are the Laodicean church. And what's tragic about this, um, Caroline, is that um, the, the church in Laodicea uh, in, in Revelation was lukewarm. It was apathetic. It was indifferent. It thought it was alive, but it was actually dead. It thought it was prosperous, but it was completely impoverished. Um, spiritually, it was bankrupt. There's a call. Uh, um, to hear and to obey the words of the Lord and to, to return to um, a, a state. Uh, he says, I wish you were hot or I wish you were cold, but you're lukewarm, so I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. It's a warning that uh, God is patient, but there's a day and time when God removes the lampstand. He causes certain churches to cease to be called churches. Churches need to be active in praying for and raising awareness for our brethren um, around the world who are uh, facing such extreme persecution. Um, there's so many issues that we have to think through and that we have to deal with, um, but um, I, I think ultimately we have to uh, commit one another, God's people, into His hands, trusting um, the words of our Lord Jesus who said, Look, this is going to happen. Yeah, th th there will be people John 16, um, he says uh, right at the beginning, Jesus tells his disciples, some will think that they're doing God a service when they kill you. Uh, that time has been at various stages throughout history. It certainly is now. No, absolutely. And I just want to read a bit more of this report because this report is uh, incredibly significant. It says survivors of the report that the Fulani affiliated armed groups use religious rhetoric while conducting a marad of attacks on predominantly Christian villages in Kaduna state. Kidnappers also reportedly deliberately target Christians for abduction and execution. The Nigerian government has routinely failed to investigate uh, these attacks and prosecute those responsible, demonstrating level of apathy on part of the state officials. Now, uh, it also goes on to say that Christians living in the north and the uh, middle belt of Nigeria, persecution is rife and relentless, and that since 2015, violence uh, has been targeted at Christians, and at least 8,400 Christians uh, have been murdered, uh, thousands have been maimed, kidnapped, 
and others have had their homes and their livelihoods destroyed and more than two million have been displaced. That's two million people displaced from their homes. We, we saw the horrendous and we have continued to see the horrendous civil war taking place in Syria with a big migrant crisis. Now this is two million Christians being forced out of their homes and to flee their homes because of these terrorist attacks. And yet again, the, uh, the church sadly is, is silent. We have this email with a huge Christian population in the UK being of Nigerian descent. It's rather surprising this issue is not in the headlines, at least in the Christian African communities. I would say that uh, m among my Nigerian Christian friends, this situation is all too well known. It is all too personal. Many have um, commented, many have tried to raise awareness. Tragically, among the indigenous church in the UK, there's um, a almost always indifference and disinterest uh, for whatever reason. Uh, it, it's seen as a, a non-issue or uh, it's just dismissed as perhaps tribal or, or um, the, the question is asked, well, are, are these people really Christians? There's always some measure of doubt that is, is cast upon these Nigerian Christians that we don't cast on Christians elsewhere in the Middle East. Hence why I, I'm, I'm concerned that there is in some cases some underlying um, racial issues where uh, Nigeria is not of interest to us for some reason. Um, uh, and, and that's something that I think we need to ask God for discernment on and, and pray to Him about. But um, definitely we need to be seeking um, the Lord as to how we can best support our brethren in Nigeria. Absolutely. So earlier today I recorded uh, a Zoom interview with uh, Fred Williams who is who has camp <coughs> been campaigning on, on, behalf of the on behalf of the Nigerian Christians in north of Nigeria for the last uh, two decades. Uh, he's a filmmaker as well and uh, this is the interview that I did with him earlier today. Uh, Fred Williams, who is a filmmaker and a campaigner on behalf of Christians living in northern Nigeria. Um, Fred, uh, warm welcome to the program. Thank you. Good to have you welcome me. I feel like I'm at home. <laughs> <laughs> I think you could be. Um, Fred, can you just share with us uh, how you've got involved with the plight of Christians in northern Nigeria, considering that uh, Christians there face genocide? Well, it's a personal journey for me. Um, 20 years ago, I began to experience what the Christians are experiencing now because I pastored in Joss and um, we were attacked in the church. And a few friends had warned me that uh, there's a trend about to begin on a plateau in the middle belt uh, of Nigeria. And I did not agree with them because I felt Joss was the most peaceful place. But all of a sudden, violence broke out and if there's an election, if there's like the Danish cartoon, if anything at all of global significance to do with um, certain topics, they just attack us. And so while the Twin Tower were crumbling, I will never forget that we had been on the road since the 7th. That's, we had our own 9-11 two days before and the church was attacked. In fact, I just found some footage of the attack of the church building, which I'll send to you. Um, and it was so surreal. It was like a horror movie, really. Just firsthand, you see all sorts of bloodshed and killing and chanting. And it's like something you see in a horror movie, really. And uh, it's never stopped since then. And it's taken on a wider, larger, more ominous proportion as you see the killings expand, you know, across not just places like Plateau and Kaduna but the whole of the Middle Belt and other northern regions. So um, it's a so personal Fred, journey. Fred, uh, can, you, can you share with us, um, uh, can you share with us and put into context these Islamist attacks uh, and, and why are they deciding to target Christians in the north of Nigeria? But now what we've seen recently is they're attacking Christians in the Middle Belt of Nigeria because um, to, for our viewers to understand something of Nigeria, it's divided in two, isn't it? Between pretty much the Muslim North and the Christian South, there's a rotation of the uh, presidency from a, a Christian president to uh, a Muslim president. 
Um, and yet we see in the north uh, where you're campaigning that there are 12 states and they're all governed by Sharia law. Um, so can you put into context why Christians are being targeted um, in the most horrendous way? Um, it's obvious that there is some sort of an agenda to um, radically um, rule and take over the nation. They've been very clear. I remember the mosque next door kept announcing, even before the attacks intensified, that we are going to take over, we're going to start from this area, and then we're going to spread. And it's well known that um, there's an agenda to not just Islamize, but in a radical way, enforce a kind of um, radical expression of Islam in Nigeria. That's what really is happening. Uh, there's a very interesting documentary called Plateau the Final Frontier. And in that documentary, we see the warning that the violence is going to spread from northern Nigeria to the Middle Belt. In fact, I was stated clearly in that documentary that watch Plateau, watch Benue State, watch Kaduna State, watch those areas, and then watch how it's going to spread out up till just last week and even this week there have been attacks in kaduna state you know southern kaduna in benue state and then in kogi state i mean the attacks have just been relentless so it's basically radical enforcement of um a particular expression of islam uh, uh, Fred, can you share with us um, the Islamist groups that are based in uh, northern Nigeria? Uh, we have uh, Boko Haram, uh, the Islamic State West Africa province, and the Fulani herdsmen. How are they all working together to try and rid uh, the north of Nigeria and now the, uh, the, the middle of Nigeria from Christians, from, from having a Christian presence? Sorry. I think it's very interesting your choice of words, describing them as... Um... Um, I mean, that's the thing. There is a war of narrative going on. They are called Boko Haram, and then from Boko Haram, they pass the baton to headsmen, and then now we hear bandits. And there are different um, narratives describing the same impact. We see people are raped, their houses are burnt, looted, lands de destroyed. I went just about a few weeks back, I went to Kaduna State, I went to Plateau State, I went to Abuja, I went to Lagos, and everywhere, including Lagos. So it's not just happening in northern Nigeria, there is a spread. And the victims are not just Christians. That's the interesting thing I'm finding out that, yes, they are targeting Christians, but this, this hydra, this ideology, would destroy anyone that does not agree with it, including peace-loving Muslims. And so you see that in Adamawa state and some other states where anywhere a cleric, Muslim cleric speaks out against um, radical Islam, they are taking out. They target strategic leaders across the nation, you know, and even politicians. But particularly, I think there is a strategic wiping out of Christian leadership. And like you described, uh, the Northern region is even though they have said that it's predominantly Muslim, there's actually a strong Christian presence in the north. There's a Christian belt in, in northern Nigeria, in Katsina, in Kanu, in some of those states. Chibok and all those areas are Christian settlements that were targeted, you know. So it's uh, just, there's a book I, I, I just, I was reading, sent to me, the Sur Surviving the Forgotten, the Armenian Genocide. And what's happening, in Nigeria is similar to that. They target strategic Christian leadership in politics, in, in government, and of course, strategic leaders and silence them and put fear in them and get them to leave their land, which is what is happening. People are fleeing, you know, and it's very complicated, very sophisticated and very, um, they are well supported, if, if I must say that. <laughs> Uh, and Fred, uh, according to the US Commission on Religious Freedom that published its annual report in, in April, um, this is what they said about Nigeria. They said that more Christians have been killed for their faith in Nigeria in the last year than the entire Middle East. Now, what does that say about the plight facing Christians from uh, these Islamist terrorists in Nigeria? 
it is it's it's so real and um honestly we cannot even exaggerate how serious it is and that's why when we were attacked i remember clearly in joss i i i was so um i was so frustrated about the fact that nobody came to help and i'd visit the uk and i'd hear on new on the news that christians and Muslims are fighting. And I said, no, not exactly. They're actually attacking innocent communities. And what happens is these communities, some are wiped out and some have to defend themselves and they become reactive. And then of course there's repressal killing. And then it just gets out of hand as hatred grows and increases, which is what is happening in those areas. I went into some of the IDP camps, internally displaced people all over Joss in several places. Thousands of people have lost their livelihood, lost their properties, lost their land. They've sacked them completely from there, and headsmen have taken over in Plateau. You know, at least I know because I I went to Plateau and I interviewed some of the IDPs myself. Kaduna, the same thing. Southern Kaduna. What is happening in Southern Kaduna is incredibly horrendous. They are literally wiping out communities there. So it's it's it's, and it's shocking the rate at which the infantry. The, the boldness, the audacity, you know, and uh, it's almost as if there's a tag team between the headsmen and Boko Haram, and they're asking for the same thing. And then, of course, we also have the spate of kidnappings and bandits. All of them are doing the same thing, which is just wiping out innocent people. Yeah. Uh, and Fred, according to the, uh, the Bonobus Fund, that, uh, that since 2015, uh, extremist violence uh, has killed at least 800, uh, 8,000, um, sorry, I'll that again. So, yeah, so according to the Barnabas Fund, um, they're saying that the number of uh, Christians that have been murdered at the hands of these Islamists is around 8,400. Uh, thousands have been na uh, maimed, uh, kidnapped, and had their homes and livelihoods destroyed and that more than 2 million Nigerian Christians have been displaced. Um, to simply put it, this is ethnic cleansing, isn't it? So why is the world silent? But more importantly, why is the church so silent um, on the, regarding the plight of these, uh, of these Christians in, in Nigeria? I think the plight of the Christian initial, in Christians in northern Nigeria was seen as a, something that is unique to that region. But we're beginning to discover that it's not unique to northern Nigeria or Middle Belt and it's spreading. Also, this, this hydra, for lack of a better description, is very intelligent and it exploits unique challenges on ground to ferment its agenda. And so even though people are being killed and people are being raped and children, girls are being kidnapped and being forced into marriage, um, they call them bandits. They call them headsmen, but these guys carry sophisticated weapons. And it appears from, at least from the last president of Nigeria, the previous uh, president, Jonathan, good luck, Jonathan, said that his presidency has been infiltrated. So who knows whether there's collusion? Because how can, in a country as big as Nigeria, thousands are being killed across, and it's as if it's growing and is increasing. Could it be that there are moles inside the, in high places? Could it be they've infiltrated uh, certain strategic places of leadership to foment their agenda? Could it be that they are influencing and pressuring people and muscling their mouths, you know? And so people are even scared to talk about it. I had a personal experience, and that's why I can talk boldly. I have footage, I've lived in the area, so it's not hearsay, you know? But there seems to be on a global scale as well as on a local scale, telling the story in a unique way to actually detract from the truth of the horrors. And, and unfortunately, uh, people are reactive instead of being proactive and being strategic absolutely. in their responses. So, um, so Fred, uh, my, my, my final question to you, which is uh, an extremely important question. Um, what can our viewers do to help uh, these Christians in Nigeria that are currently facing um, genocide? Uh, because it's time that the church really woke up to, to their plight and, and also campaigned on, on their plight. Of course, we can pray. But what practical measures can we also um, do in order to ensure their safety and protection? 
Well, I think we have to be a voice for the voiceless. Um, on my last visit, I interviewed the Khan chairman of Kaduna, Reverend Hayab, and I'll send his footage. I, I hope we're able to watch that footage. As he said, they're even targeting him, and this is uh, the spokesperson for Northern Nigeria, of the Christian Association of Nigeria, and then also the Khan chairperson of Kaduna, that is a prominent strategic leader, and their death threats literally is being targeted. Can you imagine how serious that is? So the, there is a strategic agenda to put the fear of the, of the terrorists. So sometimes, uh, and it's important that we realize what's happening. Sometimes they'll come and they'll shoot in the air and not shoot for people to come out. Then they'll use uh, machetes and in a very barbaric way, cut them up and, and slaughter people to create fear. They will send a message out that we're coming to kill you, we'll wipe out your village, we'll come and kidnap you, and there's nothing you can do about it. This is exactly what has happened to Reverend Hayab. As I interviewed him, I was wondering, will this be the last time I'm going to see this man alive? A few days ago, they made an attempt on his life. Exactly what they said they would do. And so if strategic leaders are being taken out like that, then we need to, one, raise awareness about the reality of what is going on instead of allowing them to like craft the narrative in a particular way, just tell the truth. We are being killed for our faith. Christian freedoms are being wiped out. The injustice of rape and arson needs to be documented properly. What is happening in Afghanistan is a typical example. And very, it looks like Nigeria is heading towards that place. And what happened in Afghanistan seems to have even um, it seemed to have inspired or emboldened the terrorists more across the globe and particularly in Nigeria because if they can win in the battle against terror in a place like against America, you can imagine they were celebrating and rejoicing. This is very serious. We see the trend spreading. So what can we do? One, continue to create awareness, refuse to embrace the fear they're perpetrating. I've had people advise me to say, are you crazy? Why are you talking about this thing? Don't you know you'll be a target? Now, but if we're not the voice for the voiceless, who will be? Thirdly, we need to pressure our governments in the diaspora and raise an alarm and raise the historic um, policies that have led to this, that has enabled certain quarters you know, the government policies to continue to like, we should raise an alarm and make it uncomfortable, even for the British government. Let them know if terror overruns Nigeria, Britain will feel it. We should also continue to like support the victims of terror. And most importantly, we actually need to continue to practice the teachings of Christ. We cannot allow the hatred to override, overrun, and craft us. We have to go in and build the nations, build a community. Now, when they attacked us, I picked up a gun. Thank God I didn't have to use it. But I put my gun away and I said, you know, I'm going to take a camera. And I think instead of trying to shoot at the enemy, trying to kill me, I'm going to tell the stories of people who are loving back, who are building the community and who are refusing to allow the fear and the terror rule them. I can go uh, on. <laughs> and Fred, I just thank you so much uh, for being our guest on Behind the Headlines. Thank you for your dedication to the people of uh, northern Nigeria and for the campaigning you do, and also for letting the world know about the plight uh, of your people, which is really, really important. So thank you for joining us today on thank Behind you. Headlines. Really helpful interview there from Simon and Fred. Thank you both for that. We have some emails. Uh, this is from Maggie. Maggie gives what um, she presents are some solutions. Uh, first, we must pray for Nigeria. Uh, second, all viewers must now write to the Archbishop of Canterbury asking why he hasn't spoken in the House of Lords about the 1,400 slaughtered Christians in the first few months of 2020. And um, while that's a very valid question um, to ask, I, I would just 
um, draw your attention to some answers that the Archbishop provided in relation to this situation on the 22nd of April 2021, um, asked uh, by various members of Parliament. The response was, uh, the persistent attacks in northern Nigeria by Boko Haram and Islamist militia are a source of profound concern to the Archbishop of Canterbury, who knows Nigeria well, and to the wider church. We're in regular contact with the Nigerian authorities in the Foreign Office. Um, and so th they apparently are aware, though none of us would have known it, um, that we've not heard that much um, about it. But th thank you for those good suggestions, Maggie, as well, um, encouraging people to write to their M MP. Michael uh, says he's once again managed to tune in. Why do churches not comment on what's happening in Nigeria? One simple answer, they've lost their first love. National UK church leadership is an utter disgrace. Any UK church who can defy scripture um, is not fit to call itself a church. Um, Philip asks where the funding comes from and uh, for the Fulani herdsmen in Boko Haram. Uh, Maybe the Middle East. Yeah, definitely, definitely the Middle East. And if you throw in um, the Islamic State of West Africa as well, and I mean, all of these groups are kind of interconnected in some way. And they, they have their funding coming out of the same pot. Um, they're coming from very wealthy or rich Sunni. Absolutely, but this is something that we can't afford to be silent on. Um, the plight of Christians in Nigeria, as they are facing ethnic cleansing, they're facing genocide, and very briefly towards the end of the program, we've got this uh, another report that's been published by the Nigerian International Society for Civil Liberties and the Rule of Law, and this uh, dates between <coughs> the 1st of January and to the 18th of July 2021, saying that 17 Christians a day were murdered for reasons related to their faith, the first half of 2020, the second highest daily average since 2014, where over 5,000 Christian deaths were recorded at the hands of Boko Haram and the Jihadi Fulani herdsmen. And then it says in addition to the children, uh, sorry, in addition to the Christians who have been killed in the first 200 days of 2021. Some 3,000 Christians, many of them young girls and women, have been kidnapped by Islamic terrorists and their whereabouts remains unknown. And it's believed that at least three out of every 10 kidnapped Christians have been killed. And finally, some 300 churches were threatened or attacked or closed or destroyed or burnt since, 2000, uh, since January uh, 21. One of the things that we as Christians need to remember, Simon, is that we shouldn't be surprised when we experience persecution or when our, our brothers and sisters face persecution around the world. Um, indeed, we should constantly be in prayer for those who are experiencing um, these threats to their lives and their livelihoods. Uh, Jesus in John 15 said, when we are hated, we should remember that he was hated first. So he already said in, in John 16, he says there will be people who think they're serving God when they kill you um, in, in some cases. And then in Revelation, we see a, a beautiful picture. It's a tragic picture in many ways, but um, uh, the scene where this, the saints uh, of God are, are crying out under the altar in the throne room of heaven, crying out, how long, how long until you avenge um, us against those who have persecuted and who have taken our lives. And the Lord gives a, um, a, 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 a new white robe to those saints and says, rest a little while longer. The day is coming soon. And indeed, we look forward to that day when all things will be made new and we will know full, utter, total triumph. Absolutely. I think that's a great way to end the program, but, but also there's uh, the practical things we can do. Uh, we need to pray and hold the Christians in Nigeria close to our hearts and pray and intercede for them. But we also need to contact our members of parliament to let them know of the horrors that's taking place and maybe actually tie a British aid money to Nigeria. Um, to ensure that Nigeria will not get any British aid money, as the American report recommended that there should be no US aid uh, to Nigeria unless they deal with the uh, persecution of Christians and actually bring those perpetrators to justice. It's a very prudent point and uh, something that we have to be aware of. Even as we give charitably, perhaps uh, we need to make sure that it's going um, not to overhead organizations, but to the boots on the ground. 
um, making sure that um, the people who really need, um, need the care are provided it. So that's uh, behind the headlines, 22nd of September 2021. Uh, we'll continue, God willing, next week to bring you um, yet more news, uh, looking at from a Christian perspective, going um, behind the headlines for our, our viewers, good and God's glory, hopefully. Uh, please be thinking through and looking at how you uh, can be reading everyday news through the lens of scripture. Uh, Simon, great program. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful interview. This is Behind the Headlines. We'll see you next week. God bless.